So yeah, I've been fortunate to work in this area for um, over a decade now. Um, and so when, uh, you know, uh, Stefan asked me if I could give an uh, opening keynote, I decided to sort of take a sort of data centric um, view. So, um, okay, before I start, um, I should acknowledge that what I'll be presenting is joint work with many, many, many people. I mean, this is, uh, you know, really I've been, I've been fortunate to work with people in, um, in academia, but also at UN agencies and NGOs. Uh, I'll just pick out sort of two names in particular. So there's Emilio Zakini, who's currently um, uh, a research director at the Max Planck Institute uh, uh, for demographic research. And there's also my long-term friend and collaborator, Kiran um, Garimela, who both uh, you know, really contributed to this line of work over the last um, a decade or so. So um, I want to start by briefly reflecting on uh, what makes a good um, research project. And there are many ingredients, but I'll focus on sort of uh, uh, three. So one at least to me personally, is a relevance, right? So, so, right? so hopefully what you do has um, relevance that goes ideally beyond academia, right? Sort of, sort of, so, so at least I like to always reflect on also what will be the impact um, uh, of my work, right? And some people only approach their research from this uh, angle, right? So they might start with a, uh, you know, sort of broadly defined project. Okay, let's study Ukrainian migration. And clearly there's sort of, you know, relevance and impact. So let's, let's go um, with sort of with a relevance angle first. Um, another aspect, of course, is then the, sort of the, the data um, aspect, right? Sort of also, so if you want to study something, hopefully there's some sort of data, right? Sort of also to analyze, right? So you should sort of think uh, critically and sort of creatively about um, the type of data that you will uh, use, right? And other, some research are very sort of data centric, right? So and I, I used to be a Twitter guy for a while, right? Sort of, also, sort of, also, okay, let's start with Twitter data and we'll figure out the rest later, sort of. Also, right? So that's another sort of approach, right? And then, of course, last but not least, there's the actual um, method sort of first, right? so so how you know, once you have sort of data and once you have hopefully like a sort of like a research question of relevance how do you actually analyze um, and then sort of right? and of course especially in computer science you have many people who are sort of very method centric right like sort of so I'm a computer vision guy or maybe uh, you know you're an expert on sentiment analysis right so I want to do sentiment analysis and let's go and find some data I can apply sentiment analysis to right um, in this talk I will um, focus mostly on the data aspect but of course the data is also tied to the other things so there will also be elements of the uh, methods part. But I'd be happy to sort of uh, talk about the first element uh, also later in the, um, you know, in the Q&A, as well as in the sort of in the coffee break. So um, the structure of the talk will basically be a uh, sort of run through different experience reports, uh, reporting on, you know, sort of work using different types of data sources. So I'll spend quite a bit of work looking at um, sort of Facebook advertising data, then satellite imagery, geotag tweets, and then time allowing uh, some other uh, data sources that we uh, used over the past decade or so. Um, right. Um, so, in a nutshell, so the goal of this talk is kind of to see all of Europe in a week, uh, right? Sort of or so, which uh, might be a bit of a uh, big ask. Uh, so, if you, you know, if you Google if this is even plausible, right, you come up with sort of epic itineraries. So, um, you know, hopefully this will be like a bit of a sort of epic speed run um through the through the topic so um with that in mind let's um get uh, moving so um first data source i want to talk about is uh facebook advertising data and actually for those who haven't seen this before live i'd like to start by making this as concrete as uh, possible so what you see here um is uh, facebook's advertising platform so this is publicly accessible for free. So you have access to this as long as you have a Facebook account without paying, uh, you know, a single um, a cent, right? And so here I'm at the step um, of creating an advertising campaign where I get to select my target audience, right? So who is it that should see my ad um, uh, in the end, right? And so far I've selected Facebook users living in a part of Colombia that's called Norte de Santander which is on the border with uh, Venezuela. So it's sort of Venezuela in the, um, in the east and then sort of the rest of Colombia in the uh, west, southwest, right? So far, I've just selected Facebook users aged 18 and above, all genders and otherwise no further sort of uh, limitation. And now the crucial thing to observe is this thing here on the right, right? So, so Facebook provides a so-called um, audience estimate. So hopefully you can sort of see this, it says 1 to 1.2 million uh, users, um, where Facebook estimates how many people match your targeting criteria. So this essentially gives you a real-time, no-cost digital census of almost 3 billion Facebook users. Right? So you can sort of ask of, these, of the Facebook user population, how many match certain criteria? Right? So for example, of these 1.2 um, million people, how many are um, uh, women? 
right? So for example, in some of our other work, we look at digital gender gaps, right? Sort of, so who has access to sort of Facebook? Well, and here it's sort of split roughly equally down the, um, at the middle, right? Which is great. But now from a, a migration point of view, you can also look at how many of these Facebook believes to have lived in another country, in particular, uh, you know, where Facebook believes they, that they used to live in um, Venezuela, right? So now we're just looking at women in this part of uh, uh, Colombia who used to live in uh, Venezuela, right? And again, without paying anything, Facebook provides uh, an estimate, right? And so the question is, how good is this estimate, right? How is it obtained? Those sort of questions are not sort of uh, questions to, um, uh, to look at, right? But this is um, the sort of the, the key um, data source that we use um, uh, for a lot of um, this work. Um, maybe just to make it a bit more, even more concrete, I'll show you some data visualizations uh, around this. So this is uh, data we collected uh, maybe just uh, four years ago or sort of, so quite a while, almost sort of five years ago already. Um, in this case for New York um, City, right? So suppose you didn't know anything at all about the city and you wanted to understand a wealth distribution, right? Then you could um, look at just data from Facebook's advertising platform and look at the distribution of devices that are used to access Facebook. So let me try to explain what you sort of see um, here. So, so according to data that's pre-collected, again, it was collected almost five years ago, um, in sort of Manhattan and Midtown, about 90% of Facebook users are using iOS devices to connect to um, Facebook, right? So generally iOS devices are more expensive than uh, other types of uh, devices, right? So if you uh, sort of, um, to wait, sorry, we'll go back, right? And if you compare this with, sort of, with the area of the sort of, um, of the Bronx, where it's about sort of 40%. Right? So just looking at the device types, you would probably assume that there's a sort of wealth differential between these two areas, right? Or looking at the sort of, um, you know, my migration background, you could look at, um, you know, where do people live now? We used to live in Latin America in the past. And you would see that according to sort of this sort of Facebook advertising data, again, sort of in parts of the Bronx, about sort of 40% of uh, Facebook users, um, uh, you know, used to live in Latin America. Right, so, so and you can sort of find this out in, for any place in the world, sort of, for, sort of, so in pretty much real time, uh, for free. Of course, here just it's sort of pre-collected to have a nice visualization. Right, of course, in the case of New York City, of course, you have good open government data. You don't need any, you know, of this sort of toy data. But in other parts of the world, you don't necessarily have open government data. Right, so for some, this includes city of Doha in Qatar, uh, where I'm from. You don't have uh, zip codes, which you have to sort of use other types of geographic uh, targeting. Right. So if you, for example, you wanted to understand the situation of Nepali migrant workers, you can look at, okay, Facebook users who used to live in Nepal, right, where they're uh, predominantly found, they're predominantly found in the so-called industrial area. Now, again, there's no official sort of ground truth you can validate this against, but if you Google sort of industrial area uh, Doha, you would see that this area was built to house people from uh, South and Southeast Asia, so sort of. so and certainly with, this also sort of aligns with my experience living in the city, right? Uh, they're almost all uh, men, uh, very young, right, which is a blessing during COVID times, and almost all Android device users, right? Very few can afford iOS uh, devices. If you contrast this with people from um, other backgrounds, for example, Western Europe and North America, um, I live right here, right, which is quite typical for people like me, sort of, so in, in a, sort of in a high-rise building. It's roughly gender balanced. I can bring over my, um, my wife and my, and my daughter. Um, a lot of university graduates, you know, older people, these are sort of knowledge experts, let's say, and more iOS than Android device users, right? Just to sort of show you what you can sort of do, again, for free, for anywhere um, uh, in the world. But of course, quality, you know, the question is, how good is this, right? Is this actually sort of good, meaningful um, data? So we spent quite a, a lot of time trying to sort of to validate this data and sort of see uh, when it can be used and for which uh, purposes, right? So this is... Um, a figure from a study uh, that we did um, in 2017 or sort of or so, right? Um, where we um, looked at data from the US at the US state level um, from different sort of countries of origin. So for example, every, so, so for, for this data point here is for um, people who used to live in Mexico, now living in California, right? So it's a combination of sort of country of origin and host state um, uh, in the US. And now you have these, sort of these two uh, dimension sort of, sort of so on the y-axis you have a sort of arguably ground truth from the American uh, community uh, survey right? so the, what's the percentage of the total population that uh, now lives in California that's born um, in uh, Mexico right on the x-axis um, we have to show the, the, the equivalent of sort of what's the percentage of Facebook users who match this uh, criteria right and you can certainly it's not a perfect match right but it's also not that far off right just as a sort of a first uh, step right and probably uh, so here, I think I have this sort of, so here, right? So this is the area where Facebook would underestimate, 
right? Like pseudocons, right? So in most areas, probably uh, Facebook would underestimate uh, uh, the percentage of um, uh, uh, migrants, right? And but maybe there are some combinations where Facebook are overestimates. Um, if you look at it sort of at a global level, so now a similar plot, but just slightly different um, uh, meaning. So not every data point is a host country, like a whole country, no longer a state. Um, and the percentage is just the, the total percentage of uh, you know, population or sort of Facebook users that are um, uh, either foreign born or that used to live abroad, right? So there's only sort of this slight uh, disconnect in terms of definitions. And so, so first, this is the identity line. This is already a regression line. This is the uh, identity line. And so now these are areas where Facebook uh, underestimates and these are Facebook uh, uh, areas where Facebook overestimates. So let me try to walk you sort of through what you see here. So these data points in red are different countries in Africa, right? And so for, um, for countries in Africa, typically migrants, sort of, so if you move to Kenya, sort of, sorry, then you are more likely to be on Facebook than the other residents, right? Sort of, so this means that sort of in, in those sort of locations, Facebook would typically overestimate um, uh, migrants, right? Sort of, so and then if you look at sort of other locations, sort of, sort of so Europe, it's sort of already less uh, of an um, uh, uh, overestimation uh, issue, right? But, but see, so, so there are certain geographical um, uh, patterns that appear to be non-random, right? So hopefully there's some sort of uh, thing you can model um, by understanding um, you know, sort of, um, the, the selection biases. So drilling even deeper, sort of, so at these sort of selection biases, again, going now back to the um, uh, US, um, here's a graph that sort of looks at age and gender specific um, biases. So, so uh, on the um, left, you have data for men. On the right, you have data for women. On top, you have data for California. At the bottom, you have data for um, uh, Texas. Right. So let's look at just this. Um, uh, here, we look at men living in California. Okay. According to the ACS in the age group uh, 40 to 44, about 20% of men um, you know, in this age group were born in, um, in Mexico. Right. So this is much, quite a bit higher than Facebook's estimates, right? Which might be sort of around sort of 15 um, uh, percent or so, right? But now, um, so so first you see, you know, the, the generally the older the age, the the, the bigger the gap to to a degree, sort of. So, so Facebook underestimates older Mexicans, right? Like in general, right? But then at the youngest age, you'd see that this gap actually disappears. But right? at the very very youngest age group, actually Facebook comes up with a bigger estimate, right? Which is also interesting, sort of, sort of, sort of. So what might be going on there? But now the, the crucial thing to observe is that this sort of, you know, the pattern of the bias is, is somewhat consistent, right? It's sort, of, it's sort of consistent more or less across sort of genders and even across um, locations, right? So that again, hopefully you can sort of model uh, this bias, right? if, assuming you have it for some locations, right? Hopefully you can then learn the, uh, the, the, sort, of the, the sort of the debiasing formula and apply it to um, other locations, right? And so one simple way to do this, it's a very, very simple way, right? So if you Suppose you wanted to sort of predict the percentage uh, foreign born in a given location for a particular age and gender group, for a particular um, uh, country of birth, and for a particular sort of target, let's say, right? So then you just put everything together. Right? So first order approximation is just, okay, what's going on on Facebook? And then you add certain bias terms, right? So maybe certain um, countries of origin are over or underrepresented. Uh, certain age groups are over and underrepresented, um, uh, et cetera, right? And so with this simple sort of, um, sort of uh, correction sort of so you um, evaluate it in an out of sample um, manner you bring down the um, you know the, the, the percentage error from uh, uh, so 56 percent to sort of 37 percent right? using a very very simple model that doesn't even look at sort of GDP or internet penetration or um, a language um, spoken right so, so clearly there's sort of there's some it seems to be like a quite powerful sort of data source uh, for this now um uh, so after validating this, right, so broadly that there is a, seems to be a strong signal, we've been using it uh, operationally, working with UN partners in different uh, contexts. And so here I'll talk about our experience uh, working in the Venezuelan context uh, uh, in a second, right? And so um, let me see, walk you through what you sort of see um, here. So everything here is for Facebook users who used to live in Venezuela. Okay, so here we're only talking for people from uh, Venezuela, and every everything else is for a different host country or host region, right? So, for example, let's look at the data in red, right? So now we're looking at people from Venezuela living in Colombia. If you look at this bar down here, the lower estimate is just the raw number of active Facebook users who lived in Venezuela 
that at this time, right? So this is sort of when the data was collected in June 2018. So that's just the, 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 the raw uh, estimate. Now that's likely to be an underestimate, right? Because probably not all of the Venezuelan migrants uh, are on Facebook, right? And so if we, um, if we assume that there are no false positives here, we somehow have to correct for the sort of Facebook penetration, right? Now we don't know the exact Facebook penetration among Venezuelan migrants, so now we make a big assumption, right? We assume that it's the same as among the Colombian host population. So if we know if, if we assume that in all of Colombia the Facebook penetration is 60 percent, then there's sort of 40 percent missing. Right? So this is now this sort of very simple correction. Right? So we're assuming you know sort of so it's the same as in the host country, we're missing the 40 percent. Right? So if, under that assumption, this would be the actual number of um, sort of industry in the migrants. So and then we sort of monitor this across time, and we can sort of see how it sort of you know uh, differs among host countries and host regions. Again, the question is how, how good are these estimates, right? Like sort of, sort of so what's, what's the sort of ground truth to compare against, right? I mean, nobody knows for sort of sure, but if you compare against different um, UN estimates, sort of, so, so this is now for all of Latin America, this is sort of the, 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 the gray bar, right? So just raw numbers collecting for um, a Facebook penetration. You'd sort of see that there's broadly similar estimates to UN report, but probably higher sort of so. Now, again, ultimately we don't know for sure, you know, Who's right or who, um, who's, who, who's wrong? Sort of, but certainly at least plausible, right? That it might actually be higher than the, the numbers in these um, reports. But right? also interesting that even within the UN system, right? Different, depending on methodology, you have sort of different different estimates that are um, uh, derived. To validate it a bit more, we also work with partners in Colombia, uh, actually, sort of or so, who um, who also help to get data from the um, uh, uh, um, Colombian government. Um, uh, uh, at the time. And so here, um, this is now at a sort of sub-national level, right? So here on the left, you have uh, numbers of uh, Venezuelan migrants according to self-registration, right? So they were basically asked, please come and, you know, register yourself, make yourself sort of counted, right? And this is in the data that's sort of uh, plotted uh, uh, here. Um, on the right, you have data that was collected around the same time uh, using this Facebook advertising. Right? And if you sort of zoom out, okay, there's some sort of similarity, right? Sort of north of the Santander is quite high in both areas. But then further away from the border, Facebook, you know, differs quite a bit from official uh, estimates, right? And again, the question is sort of who's, who's wrong, who's right? Um, because we were working with people in Colombia, they actually came back to us and just said, you know what? This is actually more in line with what we observe on the ground than this, right? And their explanation was that uh, the self-registration efforts were much more pronounced on the border and not so much further inland, sort of, sort of. So it's quite likely that the government was undercounting people further away from the border, right? Which is then sort of interesting, right? That, you know, this sort of this big data company is probably better migration data than the government, right? Like sort of, so, right? I mean, arguably, right? And we don't know for sure, sort of, sort of, so, but there's at least some pretty reasonable evidence, I would say, that, that this is the, um, uh, the, the case. But you can also go beyond just the, the number and you can try to understand the socioeconomic situation, looking now at the device type, what I showed um, uh, before. So let me try to walk you through this um, plot here. So again, everything is for Facebook users who used to live in Venezuela, who at the time of the data collection were living in a different country, let's say Chile, or even part of a country such as Sao Paulo um, or Roraima in Brazil. Um, now the order of these uh, plots, uh, of these bars, is according to the percentage of Venezuelan Facebook users using iOS devices, so Apple devices. So to make this specific, so Facebook users from Venezuela in Roraima, Brazil, which is sort of on the border that you would typically walk to, they are very, very unlikely to use Apple devices. Only 3% of those have access to, you know, generally more expensive devices. At the other end of the um, uh, uh, sort of chart, people who make it all the way to the United States, so actually the majority of them use iOS devices, right? So this is sort of induces the order you know, somewhat oversimplifying something from, from poor to rich in a sense. Now the question is, how do we get to this Y uh, value, right? Like how do we actually try to assign like a dollar uh, number um, uh, uh, to, to these sort of percentages, right? And so for this, we trained a regression model to predict country level per capita GDP, right? So we sort of said, okay, can we predict the per capita GDP of Argentina using only the percentage of um, iOS users among the Facebook users in Argentina? Okay, so we trained a regression model. It's just using a single variable, right? What's going on uh, on Facebook users among, in terms of iOS users? This simple model works quite well. Sort of, so it explains almost uh, close to 90% of the variation uh, in per capita GDP. 
And this model is then applied to these subsets, right? This model is just a mapping of percentage IOS to per capita GDP, and this then sort of gives this number, right? So if, if Venezuelans in Chile were a country, right, that country would have a per capita GDP of about 18,000 um, uh, US dollars. Now, the precise dollar value is, you know, is, is, is not, it's not meant to be precise, but you know, we try different sort of model per, sort of, you know, variations or sort of so. And at least we always come up with these three groups, right? Where we are reasonably confident to say that, yeah, maybe not this relative order we don't know, but we are quite confident to say that these people are probably worse off in a sort of socioeconomic sense, sort of, right? So, so these are mostly neighboring countries, often, you know, maybe in walking to. These are people mostly still in sort of Latin America, and then people who make it all the way to the US or Spain in general, right? In aggregate, are probably of less concern than people, you know, just sort of next door um, in the jungle. So that's all, you know, it seems, oh, great, promising, fantastic, right? Everything's sort of uh, solved, right? Well, not quite. So I want to show some of uh, the challenges, right? Because we were sharing this data operationally. We created like a very simple dashboard sort of a sort of a sort that was used by UNHCR and others, um, where in this case shows data for um, Brazil, right? So again, when it's sort of, when it's, you know, Facebook users in Brazil, this aggregated in various ways. But just look at the head uh, lines and sort of the number on top, right? You can see the numbers sort of going up, but then suddenly at some point it goes down, right? Like sort of a so, right? So, okay, that's interesting. So what was going on in February, March, 2019, right? Was it like return migration? Were people moving on to, from Brazil to Argentina or sort of a so? Well, no, actually what was happening at the time is that change, Facebook changed its algorithm of how they classify uh, uh, Venezuelans. All right, so just from one day to the next, they do, okay, well, now it's a new number, right? How do we know for sure that that's what's happening and not actual thing? Well, we only know because we are collecting such data globally, regularly for all combinations, like how many Germans are living in Qatar, sort of, so, right? And at exactly the same point in time, we saw all of those numbers suddenly go down, right? So suddenly there are fewer Germans living in Qatar, fewer Venezuelans in Argentina, fewer Mexicans in Germany, whatever, sort of, so, right? And so they say, well, that's, you know, it doesn't make any sense, sort of, what's all right? And so we are quite confident to say that this is just an algorithmic change, right? And this is, of course, one of the key limitations. Like, we sit on top of this black box, it seems to be a powerful, useful black box, but that black box can change any day, right? Like, sort of, what's all right? And so, you know, how do you deal with this, um, sort of, what's all right? That's a key, key limitation in, when doing this uh, type of work. Um, I want to share, uh, go away from this sort of estimating, you know, raw migration flows to talk a bit about more what you can do more on this sort of, uh, not to say qualitative side, but beyond raw numbers. And so, for example, we also try to look at um, issues related uh, to sort of uh, uh, assimilation, sort of, right? Like, so, so let me try to explain this, right? So you can also target people on Facebook based on what they're interested in, right? So you can, for example, look at, you know, what are Germans living in Germany interested in on Facebook, right? And let's say 90% are interested in football, 70% are interested in the scientist Max Planck, 40% are interested in sauerkraut. Right, so I'm allowed to make this joke because I'm German, so, so, right? so um, okay, great. Okay, so that's sort of like typ typical aggregate German interests of Germans in Germany, so, so right? Um, now you can sort of compare this. What about sort of Arabs living in the MENA region, right? So maybe, um, you know, 80% of them are interested in uh, the Holy Quran, 60% are interested in Ibn al-Haytham, like a famous uh, scientist uh, from the region, 60% are interested in uh, falafel, one of my sort of, sort of favorite foods uh, after living there, right? Now the question is, Right, so this gives you kind of like, like a, I don't know, like, like a scale. So what about now uh, Arabs living in Germany, sort of, so, right? so where, where do they sort of fall in terms of this sort of spectrum, right, sort of, sort of, sort of, sort of. So, uh, do, do they, yeah, do they sort of pick up, do, do their food preferences change, or sort of, so, right, like sort of, so, right? Um, and, and of course, this is, I mean, and, and there's, I mean, methodologically, there are many, many questions around this, right, does this even make sense, how would you measure this, right, for example, one interesting, important thing to consider is, so what, what sort of interests should you consider, right? Like at some level, we are all the same, right? If I ask you, do you like music? I hope, probably, right? Some kind of music, right? Do you like technology? Probably, right? But then if you really drill down, um, maybe I'm into Puerto Rican style salsa and you're into New York style salsa, so we are completely different sort of, also, right? So it's sort of, well, you know, is this now the same or the different? How do you measure these, these kind of things? Right? So there are a lot of caveats happy to discuss this, so, but just to show you, you can sort of, you can always come up with some score, right? Like, and again, there's, there are a lot of, a lot of caveats around this, the, the score, right? Where you can sort of now compare them, right? So think of something like sort of cosine similarity in essence, right? For example, Austrians living in Germany 
are quite close to Germans, where like a higher score means uh, they're sort of so similar, uh, right? Sort of and so on. Then Spanish uh, people living in Germany, etc. Right? Then you sort of go down further. Um, uh, the, the list sort of sort of so people uh, uh, in Turkish are less similar, right? And then here you have now Arabic-speaking migrants um, who are women without a university degree, somewhat older, right? They are sort of most dissimilar. Um, whereas uh, uh, Arabic migrants for men with a university degree, slightly younger, are relatively more uh, uh, similar, right? Um, and again, this is, uh, I, this, I'm not saying this is truth in any sense, sort of sense, it's sort of like a very, very early sort of uh, um, exploration, right? Like, and it's also interesting to look at what are bridging interests, right? Maybe people who, who, maybe if they become interested in the local soccer club, do they also pick up other German interests, right? Maybe are there sort of, sort of pathways to sort of, uh, uh, also, the question is even if people should assimilate, if assimilation is good, right? That's another thing. I mean, I live in Qatar where the whole country is set up basically for me not to assimilate, right? I mean, I've lived there for nine and a half years, I still don't speak uh, Arabic, right? So, uh, but anyway, happy to discuss all of these, um, these things. Um, another thing, oh yeah, I mean, this is still more on the measuring side, sort of, or something, I should have a slide uh, earlier, sort of, or so. Um, Right, so now it's okay, what about Ukraine, right? So can you use this data for, for Ukraine? So this is a, a joint work with the University of Ex Oxford is led by um, Douglas Leisure. So what we're doing here is we're looking at internal displacement. So not necessarily yet out migration, but internal displacement. And what we're sort of doing here is we're looking at um, uh, changes in basically daily Facebook users, right? So how many, how many people are using Facebook today in Kiev? Right? What about tomorrow? What about a week ago? What about a month ago? Right? Like, uh, what about Kharkiv? Right? How does it sort of change uh, uh, across uh, the, the country? Right? Uh, so we start with this, and then we add a model to, um, to account for the population who's not on Facebook, right? the children. This is sort of where a certain assumption, right? so basically mapping between the number of women in a certain range and the um, sort of uh, children in a certain uh, range. Right? This is a strong modeling uh, assumption. And then on top of this, we are sort of correcting for changes in Facebook penetration, right? Because maybe the internet goes down overall, or you know, due to infrastructure damage, etc. So, so happy to talk about that more later. But then, with all of this, you can actually come up with something like this, right? Where, for a given location in Ukraine, you have a sort of pyramidation, um, population pyramid over time, right? Where at this particular date, more or less, sort of, or so maybe plus minus a week, um, you can sort of see how does the pre-war population uh, compare to the current. Um, uh, uh, population. Okay, yeah. and this was still more on the numeric side or sort of estimation side, jumping back again more to something more related to integration assimilation. This is work we're currently doing with uh, Upper Root uh, uh, Kauta at um, the University of Hanover, um, where we are um, looking at what are characteristics of people on Facebook who are, who are likely to be non Muslims but who are friends with people who are Muslims. Okay, how, how can we get this information? You know, well, it's sort of, sort of, so well, Facebook has or used to have the targeting criteria um, for um, friends of people who have engaged with Ramadan. Okay, so, so and, and this includes people who, who, are, who are engaging Ramadan themselves, right? So I can look at who, who has friends who celebrate Ramadan but does not celebrate Ramadan themselves. Right? What are sort of the characteristics of those, right? Sort of, so, right? And now, um, you know, if you have such a friend, that might just mean you have a lot of friends. Right? If you have connect if you have ten thousand people on Facebook, probably one of them will sort of you know celebrate Ramadan. So we have to correct for overall Facebook network size, right? And so how do we how do we do this? Well, you can target people based on whether one of their friends has an upcoming birthday, sort of a sign. And so basically, right? And so the, I mean, the more friends you have, the more likely this one of them has an upcoming birthday, right? So we can sort of correct uh, uh, one for this, right? And just to this is still ongoing work, but at least it's already quite clear that it seems that a younger age is a positive factor. So that the younger you are, the more likely you have, you seem to have these sort of inter, intercultural, let's say, I don't know, how to come to the connections. And also higher education seems to be a positive uh, thing. But then there's a lot of geographic patterns across sort of European cities that we're still trying to uh, distangle. Um, now again, talking about the limitations of this sort of work, right? This is very interesting and I'm some, you know, somewhat excited about this. But then again, Facebook changes things, right? So it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not static, right? So earlier this year, they announced some changes, right? The highlight is remove things related to religion, right? So if you wanted to collect this data now, you can no longer do this, sort of. So, so this is, you see these symbols a bit later in the talk, a couple of times, right? So again, so now, and again, we're fortunate we collected this data early enough, but we would not be able to replicate this or do this again going, um, going forward. 
And then the, I think the last thing I have on the Facebook thing is now targeted uh, online service. So this is, you know, of course, Stefan in the room is this, uh, probably the world's expert uh, on this. The only twist of our work with this is that we actually want to start with qualitative research. So currently, uh, you know, my, my colleague uh, um, Sofia Richter is actually in Greece and Italy talking to Syrian uh, migrants uh, about issues related to access to health uh, health systems, right? So, so I, and then the plan is that through this, you know, in-depth um, interviews that will generate hypotheses, and then we would like to test these hypotheses on a larger scale and maybe add some nuance uh, to this, right? And so, so we will then create a survey, or the first draft of such a survey, and that will then be sort of disseminated through sort of targeted ads on Facebook, right? We are likely to be sort of Syrians in Greece and Italy would sort of see this survey and be asked to sort of to uh, to take it. Again, we're not not the first. Again, Stefan would uh, you know much more about this sort of um, uh, work. Right? We're doing this related to access to to help. Great. So this was all about. Uh, Facebook advertising data, the rest will be much, um, uh, much quicker. So um, the next data source is something you might not have thought about as a sort of migration based data, it was actually satellite imagery. So again, let me try to show this quite uh, concretely. So we have access to uh, um, data from um, a company called, uh, okay, not now, okay. Okay, 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 I'm not gonna change my password now. Okay, sorry for this. Okay, well, you've seen satellite imagery before, so, so you, you know what it looks like, right? So it's sort of, this is a sort of the satellite imagery that you're used to from Google Earth, um, et cetera. And this is just what the platform looks like, right? This is, I, I think, uh, Chen, Chen Heath in, in, in Ukraine. And you can sort of see different sort of snapshots across, um, uh, across time, right? So what are we doing with this, right? We're not looking for, you know, building damage or trying to detect artillery or something, no. You know, something simpler, right? We're counting cars. And so um, here's an example from, um, Syria, where we just restarted this before the Ukrainian sort of war, right? Where you sort of see, okay, here, in a certain time period, there are cars visible. In another time period, there are no cars visible, right? Sort of, so, and assuming, you know, cars are driven by people, right? That probably means some people are, have disappeared, sort of, right? And so we don't do this automatically, but now there's sort of the computer science element to it, right? So we do sort of computer vision to do this sort of for all the city and sort of to detect uh, all of these cars. Uh, automatically, right? So this I can maybe show you at least, right? So here's here's something for Kharkiv, right? Before the war, um, right? So there are a lot of lot of cars, you know, along the roads and sort of other um, uh, locations, right? And now doing this, um, we would sort of look: how does it change over time, right? How does the number of visible cars uh, sort of uh, 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 change, right? And so here, this is before the war, a certain area again because. The area visible also changes. Sometimes there's cloud coverage. Sometimes the satellite only takes part of the city snapshot, sort of so. And then for there's sort of different different thresholds in terms of confidence thresholds for the algorithm, sort of so. But then for any given uh, for any different threshold, we sort of count the number of cars per square kilometer. Right. So this is sort of the pre-war. Remove remove the ignore the setting where there's not enough coverage. If you look at square kilometer. So these other two snapshots are comparable. And you'd see how dramatically the number of cars per square kilometer has dropped right, between sort of pre-war and sort of a current war sort of so. Right? And again, we're sort of continuing to collect such sort of data, right? Where we can sort of do this. And of course, not just for, in this case, it's for Kherson. You can sort of do this for other cities, right? Just to, here's now Lviv in the West, where you actually see it has gone up, right? So this is pre-war car density. And at this time of collection of six street car density has gone up, right? So this would probably indicate that people have, you know, moved, you know, have from left person, but might now be more likely to be in, uh, in uh, uh, Lviv. Um, this I'm again mighty excited about this sort of work. Um, at the moment, one limiting fact is the update frequency. So this sort of imagery you certainly don't have every day. Depends, you know, during the height of the war was available more or less every week. Now it's, the frequency has gone down to maybe once every three weeks or so. So it's gone down quite a bit. But we're also trying to do this with lower satellite, uh, lower resolution satellite imagery, which would be available daily, and even with a lag of a couple of hours, right? So we could potentially do this like, you know, by noon I could tell you the car density in the morning. So that's sort of the, 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 the goal. The, the last in-depth uh, 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 thing I want to talk about is sort of geotech tweets. This is probably you're most familiar with, right? So you can sort of, if you tag, you there sometimes there's location, right? So here I tweeted this morning, um, and you know there was a location assigned to to my tweet, um, and so um, 
here I'll just mention a work that's interesting from a methodological point of view because here we're looking at how definitions change your results, right? So when you talk about migrations, well, like, how do you define a migrant? How long do you have to be in the, in the host country? And all these kind of things, right? And sometimes the definitions are inconsistent between countries, right? And maybe different definitions lead to different, um, different results. Now, if you have individual level high resolution data, right? If you really know me every time where I am, right? You can sort of bring your own definition to me and you can sort of see how the global you know, migration patterns sort of change, right? For example, here, for the question, how long have you been in a, a, a certain location? Sort of, so here, if you look at this sort of, here's a one uh, duration, here's a longer duration. Depending on the, on the duration you're, you're, you're considering, right? maybe for this um, duration, you would, you would assign this user to be in the red country. But if you have a different definition, he's in the blue country, right? sort of depending on what you sort of use. Right? If, if, if these are sort of the, the, the countries they're in at a given time, uh, as, as inferred from Twitter. Right? Um, or you can ask, you know, where was your residence three years ago or five years ago or ten years ago? And again, sort of depending on sort of this, like what you sort of ask, you come up, you come up with different uh, results, right? And so here, I think there was so, somewhat methodologically interesting to just explore, like, how, how do the sort of the different duration definitions and the different uh, interval definitions affect what you uh, come up with, right? So I think it's sort of interesting from a methodological um, um, a point of view. Um, um, again, this is other work, again, a bit more, less on the sort of numeric side, a bit more on the sort of qualitative side, where we look at changes in social networks, right? So maybe just show me, show you the slide. So there are websites such as Follower Wonk, where you can sort of see somebody's social network. In this case, this is the distribution of my followers for followers that have on Twitter, that have the location in their, um, uh, uh, in their bio, right? And what we are interested in now is, how does this network change, right? As somebody moves, right? So, so, um, right? So, you know, maybe what did it look like before I moved to Qatar? What did it look like after I moved to Qatar? Right? In this case, it's the same, uh, same image, right? And so, for this, you need to be able to monitor Twitter's users' uh, social network across time, which is possible. So, for so this work done this because uh, tw the Twitter API um, uh, reports your followers in reverse chronological order, and so with some trickery, you can actually establish timestamps of when you started to follow. Somebody happy to talk more about that um, uh, later, right? So this is now sort of something. How you know? How does your social network change after you um, after you move? Um, maybe just one other thing on Twitter, just quickly, if you're interested in this. Um, the same platform, follow or want, also lets you search users, users, not tweets, but users um, by their self-declared location. So here you see. Hopefully, you can read this. Warsaw or Warsaw in, in in Polish, right? Sort of. So where you now sort of see these are users who have this, uh, this, this sort of location. So if you want a sample, non-random sample, of course, right? But if you want to have a sample of some Twitter users who probably are in Warsaw, right? Sort of, so you, you get this set, which is very male-dominated, if I may say so. But it's another sort of thing. Um, great, okay, five minutes. So very quickly, sort of, yeah. So we used Google Plus data in the past. As you know, Google Plus probably no longer around. It was a sort of social network that Google used. But what was interesting here is that you had sort of not, not just from two, but co-lived countries, like a set. Right? So not just one sort of origin destination, but a whole bag of countries. And so we looked at which bags are more likely than expected. Right? So maybe just quickly explain this. So even if you know that a lot of people uh, have lived in Spain and France as pairs, and Spain and Italy as pairs, and France and Italy as pairs, still, the triple appears more often than you would expect, right? So there's sort of something that this is like a positively boosted triple. I don't know how to do sort of to, to say it's like a cluster. On the other hand, even though quite a few people have lived in Brazil and Mexico, and Brazil and US, or Mexico and Brazil pairwise, the triple is not as likely as you would expect, right? So this is sort of like a sort of higher mi orders of migration patterns. Right? So it's sort of like a beyond, so we call it, Migration clusters, right? Beyond corridors to sort of clusters, right? So it's sort of interesting, this again, from a phenomenological um, point of view. And, but again, sort of, it's one of those, you can't do this anymore, it's no longer there. LinkedIn advertising data, yeah, maybe I'll show this very quickly, right? So similar to Facebook, you can look at LinkedIn. So LinkedIn users who are living in Bavaria, who are female, who studied in, Right, so uh, one of the universities in Warsaw, hopefully this is visible 
to you sort of or so. No, sorry, okay, the resolution is too poor. Okay, you have to trust me that this is just a bunch of universities in Warsaw, right? So it's all mm -hmm. targeting LinkedIn users who are now living in Bavaria, but who used to live in, in, in Warsaw. And then again, same as with Facebook, uh, so there's a number up here that says 450 users, right? So, so I can sort of, again, I don't know if these are Polish people, right? I mean, maybe these are people from Russia who studied in Poland, but again, it's sort of tells me something about uh, migration. So you can sort of create these plots, right? So people who studied in the UK, and so you can sort of see who's a net benefiter or contributor, right? So there are more people studying in the UK than sort of ending up working there and sort of other countries, Germany, kind of the other way um, uh, uh, around, for example. Yeah, yeah, Yahoo IP addresses, again, I used to be at Yahoo two, 10 years ago. Um, again, if you have, you know, based on your IP address, if you check your email, your, your email provider knows where you are. If you, if you know this information for hundreds of millions, if not billions of users, you can sort of create, uh, you know, migration estimates. And one, one problem, if you do this naively, is what you sort of see here is that, um, especially, I mean, again, we did this sort of like 12 years ago or something, um, especially at that point, um, the, the, the sampling of older Yahoo users would almost surely over, over sample more mobile users. So if you just, if you then from their mobility rates, you know, generalize to everybody in that age group, you think, oh, actually older people are more mobile than they actually are. So you have to sort of correct for the sort of the linkage between, you know, lower internet penetration, over sampling, higher mobility rates, right? So this is then what this, uh, this guy's uh, sort of here. And so we, so we, we did this to, come up with out-migration rates for the US, for which there's not a lot of good, good data. In, in my migration into the US is monitored reasonably well, but out-migration, uh, not so much. But again, so, so I'm no longer at Yahoo, and Yahoo, I mean, I guess email is still around, but it's certainly no longer as accessible to outside researchers. Google Trends, I'm sure you've, yeah, you've, you're familiar with this, so, so just FYI, it's not my work, you know, I'm just sort of working on this. Textual content of can look at you know whether people talk about violence or sort of a sound how is that predictive of um, forced migration again not my work but just to mention it as other sort of maybe relevant so Google location history this is uh, also an interesting paper that came out a couple of years ago no no a couple of years ago I think earlier this year even or not too long ago right so if you haven't seen this so on Google right you can I'm opting in to share my location right here so really on a given day right. Google knows where I was at 5.45 in the morning and where I was sort of in the evening and I'm opting in to share this data with, um, with Google. And then if you have such data for again, uh, 300 million users, you can actually come up with uh, you know, estimates around mobility. Facebook, Facebook is also sharing data or used to share data in particular related to uh, COVID-19, right? Sort of a sort through their data for good initiative. That's also very, great people behind that project, but uh, uh, also displacement maps and a lot of interesting data that was accessible uh, there. But again, you know, this black box sort of, or black box sort of changes, right? So, so they announced that they are sort of for now retiring these products and no longer updating them. So hopefully there'll be something new coming out of the data for good initiative, but for now this is, this is gone. Okay, and then I have two minutes to wrap up. Okay, so um, yeah, quick. Quick sort of recap, I know it was quite quite fast, so hopefully I think the value is relatively clear, right? So it's fast, it's cheap, almost global coverage, it's very versatile, right? You can do a lot of different things with this sort of data, right? So great, right? But hopefully it's also clear that it's not, you know, it's certainly far from, from perfect, right? So first there's, it's very volatile, right? So as you, as you saw, right, both platforms themselves change as well as the usage of those platforms, even if the platforms don't change at all, right? I mean, you know, now younger people are moving to whatever Snapchat, TikTok, and other sort of platforms, right? So you, sort of, you have to sort of adapt to this, right? It's definitely very non-representative and also noisy, right? You have fake accounts and all these sort of different things that you have to, to worry about, right? Black box, hopefully that was clear, right? I, I don't know exactly how Facebook infers where somebody has lived, right? And we can speculate about this. Privacy and informed consent can be unclear, right? Like sort of or so, like do people really understand what's possible with their data, right? Like even on, even on Twitter, sort of so it's open. Or what does informed consent even mean for satellite imagery, right? I mean, can you opt in to have you know your your car not being taken a picture of, right? I mean, what does it even mean, right? I mean, in these in these sort of uh, contexts, sort of this, right? And there's also risk of group level harm, right? Because I mean, I showed you where the Nepali are in Qatar. Okay, there's maybe no risk there, but you could imagine that I could identify other minorities in other contexts where the government might actually take some not so favorable action, right? So, so there's certainly risk um, there. Um, 
yeah, so thank you, thank you very much. I'd be happy to you know discuss also during the coffee break or otherwise feel free to reach out by, by email.